Now, it's been a, a busy weekend, and in the midst of everything else, perhaps my highlight, actually, of this weekend was this morning when we had a baptism. And we had two children, one of whom was uh, barely a month old, and they were baptized at our church in Vevey. And it's a lovely event, isn't it? Baptisms are a wonderful celebration of new life. But there are also, I think, really quite profound things that we do. Because what we're doing is we are grounding these children and these lives in a faith which we will believe will sustain them their whole lives. And if it takes root, it will help them to live well and fruitfully, blessed by God, and being a blessing to the world. It's starting them off on a journey which will last their whole lives long. But it's a good journey. Now that psalm, Psalm 1, is the beginning of a journey too. It's a really profound and important psalm. And I want to reflect a little bit on that idea of being deeply rooted. There's an image which can come up on the screen now. Can you see that? Isn't that beautiful? So that is in the highlands of Ethiopia. And once those highlands were covered in forest, but centuries of deforestation and overgrazing have left the land bare and vulnerable to drought and to the winds which blow across that part of the world. But there are these amazing things these oases of life that remain. They survive, and in fact, they flourish, and they sort of hold all of the biodiversity that remains in that place. They provide homes for the birds, for the insects which pollinate the farms. They're incredibly important and very beautiful. But how has it happened? Because they are not an accident. And they've been there for centuries, they're very ancient, but what they are is, well, the building, uh, the heart of it that you can see is a church. And it's a church surrounded by a dry stone wall, and the congregation of that church and the priest, they nurture the forest and protect it. And that forest allows the plants to put down deep roots which means that they can be sustained even in the hardest times and the driest times. And they um, provide a cool place of refreshment and shelter. They're full of beauty and of life. They are precious things. They've been there, as I say, for centuries. People haven't really noticed them until recently. But now people realize what an amazing thing they are and a testament to the work of those churches and congregations over the course of centuries. Now, I love that picture, but I want to take it as a little bit of a metaphor of what we do here at St. Peter's and churches uh, around our community and around our world, that we are creating something like that in the midst of our world. So, let me say what I mean. Did you hear in Psalm 1 that picture that was painted. It was of a a tree planted in a desert land that was rooted by streams of water. And those roots went down deep and they allowed the tree to flourish and bear fruit even through times of drought and survive even in the hardest times. And the question I think that the psalm is asking is, well, what does it look like to do that, to build lives and communities that flourish and our testament to the life-giving, living water of God. The theme echoes, it's an important one, it echoes through the Bible. So um, in Jeremiah 7, it says this, Blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. They will be like trees planted by water that sends out its roots into the stream and does not fear when the heat comes, and its leaves are always green. It has no worries in a year of drought, And it never fails to bear fruit. It's a lovely picture. I think it's a really important picture too for us as individuals and communities. 
Let me make one observation first of all. And that is perhaps the obvious one, but it's important to say. There is that realization in this passage that life can be very hard. That there will be times of heat, of drought, of hardship. And it will be times when it seems like life cannot survive. And I don't know what that looks like, but it may well be illness or grief or loss or hardship or unemployment or any number of other things. Some of you may be in times like that, times which feel very dry and very difficult right now. And that experience is clearly not evidence that God is not there or that he doesn't love you. That that experience is part of what it is like to live as fallen people in a fallen world. It's always been part of the experience of the people of God. And the question is not how you avoid those experiences, but how you put down the sort of roots that will sustain you in those times which will come. Because we need to be prepared for the fact that life will have times like that. I think naturally, we put down quite shallow roots. And we're part of a a sort of society which puts down quite shallow roots. And what that means is, is I think we sort of, we draw on that which is easily available, but probably doesn't nourish us that well, and probably will not sustain us in the hard times. The wisdom of God is to say, just be wary of the effect of so much of, of what we consume so much of the time did you hear that the passage began with a warning a negative it said blessed are those who do not walk in step with the wicked or the mockers and um, it strikes me that so much of the time what we are listening to and consuming and hearing and reading is actually not that good for us think about the voices that you hear the most the opinions which are most common And think about the sheer quantity and volume of it and what part of you that is feeding. It's not a new problem. In 1845, Henry David Thoreau, the American writer, was expressing serious concerns about the kind of corrosive effect on our souls of the sheer volume of news and gossip and print media that was available in the Victorian era. Can you imagine what he would make of the noise that we are surrounded with all the time? And we think it's normal and we don't think twice about it. The Bible says bad company corrupts good character. The danger is we're spending so much of our time in, well, I don't know, the sort of influences which just aren't that healthy for us, which don't nourish us in good ways. And we consume vast amounts of opinion and scandal and gossip and distraction. And I'm just not sure it does us any favors. There's no moralizing here. There's no saying, oh, well, that's, you know, stay away from the wrong sort of people. It's a genuine concern for my soul and for your soul. If that's what we're consuming all the time, how are we being nourished by it? I think um, one of the attractions of much of that, of kind of modern media, is that it's very immediate. It's the sort of spiritual equivalent of fast food. You know, if you ask your children what kind of food they want to eat, you know the answer. You know what that looks like. It's pizza or, or hamburgers or whatever it is. And there's something of that in us too. We like that which is quick and easy and kind of tastes great um, immediately. But actually, I think we need to be more disciplined about consuming that which actually nourishes us and helps us to put down deeper roots which will sustain us. What the psalm is saying is that we need to learn good practice. So this is what it said in verse 2. Delight in the law of the Lord. Meditate on it day and night. You see that That which is good doesn't come easily. It requires work. It's a little bit like good food. You know the difference that a a well-prepared meal makes to how you feel and to your health. But it takes preparation and work and good ingredients and time. But you know that it pays off. 
And I just think there is this kind of spiritual equivalent to that. Make choices about how you are nourishing yourself. And of course, it's not always easy. Of course, tapping into good things that nourish our soul can take some real work and some attention and discipline. It won't just happen any more than eating good food or getting good exercise will just happen unless we pay attention to it and plan it. I think that's what we're doing as a church. I think as we gather here on a Sunday evening, it's part of that decision. And we are choosing to root ourselves in God, in his word and amongst his people. The acts of worship that we do, the prayers that we pray and the sacraments that we share do that job, don't they? They nourish our souls. They help us to put down roots into that which will sustain us. And you know how important that is. And you know particularly how important that is when times are hard. I suspect many of you can look back and say, I remember going through that thing and it was being part of church which sustained me. The blessing of being part of a a loving community that was caring for me and supporting me. And that didn't just happen. That came because you did the work to be rooted in this place. And it's a blessing to you. I remember as um, uh, a teenager struggling with faith and uh, feeling like I ought to go to church but not really wanting to, you know, as I'm sure many of you experience the same. And I would go um, and I'd get to the end of it and I would just feel better. And I don't really think I understood why I felt better, but I knew that I did and that that would work. And it's sort of the simplest version of that, isn't it? We choose to do that which isn't easy, which may not appeal to us in the obvious ways straight away. There was any number of things I would have rather have been doing as a teenager, and yet we know that it does us good, and that we are nourished by it, and we grow better as a result of it. And you will be grateful for the good practice that you have learned when times are hard. I remember particularly this year going through some really difficult times, And realizing that I had to rely on that which I had learned previously in terms of prayer, in terms of connecting with God, in terms of that which would sustain me. Because in the midst of the struggle of that, I couldn't be trying to pick it up at that point, you know? I had to have learned the practice beforehand. And so this is an encouragement. An encouragement to be conscious about the roots that you are putting down and the practices that you are putting in place from a spiritual point of view, from the point of view of your soul and your character. This isn't legalism. Remember we talked about this last week, that this isn't about some rules that you need to follow. It's about making wise choices about the sort of person that you are becoming. It's about, as we said last week, keeping in step with the Spirit of God, the kind of freedom and relationship that he offers, which is like walking with a friend. Come walk with me, says God. Let us walk together. And that takes time and commitment and choice. And for each of you, God will be calling you on to the what's next, the part of your life and your understanding and your faith that needs to grow and needs to deepen. This is not a static journey. This is one where we are always growing into the what's next. My question for you this evening is, well, what's next for you? What is the area that you need to grow in and deepen and put down better and stronger roots that will nourish you? What are some of the things that I look back and think of sort of significant stages and milestones in my journey? I've already talked about one, just that commitment to being at church. I really had to struggle with that as a young person. And just being here was part of kind of putting down roots and learning and and belonging. I remember another stage, which was about just spending time reading the Bible and um, making a commitment to do that every day. And that that was a really sort of significant thing, just to be in God's word. I remember a, a significant stage, which was about getting my theology straight. Much of our theology is kind of cobbled together and it's got some good bits and some bits which are really quite shaky. 
And I remember having to actually read some proper theology in order to put some structure into place so that I could understand what it meant to be a Christian, to read good books and classic books and um, to lay those foundations and put down those roots. And then perhaps the most profound of all, actually, wasn't actually all that long ago. And that was learning to pray properly. That journey into God which prayer offers. There is so much to learn, so much to draw on, so much in the kind of rich heritage of our faith which is there to nourish us. We spend so much time in the kind of distractions of the modern world. And I'm not standing in judgment over that. It's fine. But make decisions about how you are nourishing your soul and how you are growing and how you are putting down roots. And those decisions will pay off richly and help you to live fruitfully and to sustain you even in the hardest times. Make a priority of it. Talk to one another about your journeys and what you're learning and what's important for you next and what God is calling to you. And ultimately, you know, that whole thing is a wonderful witness to the world. Just as those beautiful forest churches of Ethiopia, which are a a place of life and vitality and diversity in the midst of a barren land, So these communities are a beautiful witness of life and richness and diversity in the barrenness of so much of our world. These places are welcoming oases where anybody can walk through the door and find a place of love and welcome and compassion and understanding. I think that's right at the heart of what we are doing here at church. We're helping people to develop deeper roots which will sustain them. We're building communities full of life and love. And each of you is part of that. Each of you has a contribution to make to that, has gifts from God to bring to that. This week of Christian unity, we remember all of our brothers and sisters around this community, around Switzerland and around the world who are building these places, these oases of welcome and good news. And as we do that, we trust that we find in our relationship with God that which will sustain us through the hardest times our whole life long. Amen.